happy to be here. Um, I've not attended this workshop before. I know it's kind of late in the workshop and I was a bit punchy putting this together. So I am going to risk uh, oversimplifying important problems, insulting people, embarrassing former students, scaring current students and encouraging you all to reject my group's future papers and proposals. No, not really. Um, but I am gonna try to be simple because I'm kind of simple and because it's a broad audience. So I'm gonna make some simple points, show you a little bit of my group's work on these problems and see if we can work to connect what maybe are different communities in atmospheric and land data assimilation. So motivation, <clears throat> ecosystem CO2 and methane fluxes are highly uncertain or another way to put it. Well, yeah, uh, some of these models just don't make sense. So let's take a look. This is from uh, Shaw Feng's paper in 2019. This is just a reproduction of fluxes from the Misty MIP ensemble. It was a lovely experiment. These are means of CO2 fluxes for the Misty MIP ensemble for July 2010 over North America. And the range is really huge, right? We have a lot of uncertainty in ecosystem CO2 fluxes. So these fluxes are highly uncertain. We better use atmospheric data to sort out the truth. Well, but that's, you know, speaking from an atmospheric scientist's uh, a proud perspective, but truly the atmospheric data is too sparse to do this alone. So we need your help. Um, so my, what I'd like to describe is what we could use from the atmospheric community. Atmospheric conversions require prior flux estimates. Land data assimilations can provide these flux estimates. What could you do that would make an inverse Modeler smile. All right, so one word answer is uncertainties. So I'm gonna provide a review of my group's research efforts at land data assimilation aimed towards improving prior flux estimates and their uncertainties. And you're gonna see that more work is needed. And hopefully uh, this will encourage y'all to help us. But first, what's an atmosphere conversion? Why do the so-called we need the so-called your help? So. Sorry if this is old news to many of you, uh, just you know, sit back. For those who might not do this sort of integration or know what atmospheric conversions are about, here's a simple description. I stole this figure from Scott Denning a long time ago. Um, I've got to hide that floating MIDI controls one more time. And so this shows uh, a really simple cartoon of collecting data at one point upwind, another collection of data downwind, by measuring the change in concentration in the air, we can solve for sources and sinks of greenhouse gases. The flux is actually proportional to the change in mole fraction, upwind minus downwind, times the wind speed times the mixing depth. That's pretty simple. So what's the problem? <clears throat> the problem is we need to know what we're solving for. In this cartoon, are we solving for the power plant? Or are we solving for the forest? Or even harder, if this is all the forest, what chunk of forest are we to solve for? Um, so to write this down more explicitly, typically an atmospheric conversion will use something like this set of formulas. This is from Tomalavo's 2012 paper on the mid-continent intensive inverse analyses. We take a cost function that we minimize to solve for the flux, where x are the unknown fluxes, x naught is the prior, H is atmospheric transport, which acts on the prior fluxes. Y are the observations in the atmosphere. Uh, and then R is the uncertainty in atmospheric transport and a lot of other things. B is the uncertainty in the prior flux estimate. And that's what I want to focus on next. So B is the uncertainty in the prior flux estimate. This is a matrix equation. The matrices typically have the resolution in space of the atmospheric transport model, and I think usually in time of the prior flux model. So if we have 30 kilometer resolution over all of North America with fluxes every three hours for a year, um, we need to know the uncertainties, which are the, the flux uncertainties at any one of those points in time are the diagonals of B. The off diagonal elements of B define the covariances between these uncertainties. And basically the question is how many unknowns do we really have to solve for? That's what we need to know about B. 
This is a big problem because, you know, with those dimensions I sketched above, we've got something like 30 million unknowns. And we can't solve for that, even with atmospheric data, strong as it is. So this needs your help. And you land DA people. Sorry, I'm just being provocative because I do this too. You know, we work at flux tower sites. We measure lots of stuff and we do things at one location, but then how does this work over space and time? Or we have lots of gridded data and we constrain models all over space, but then it's not really clear how the uncertainties uh, correlate in space and time. So I'll give you a little bit about what my group has done to poke at some of these questions, some of these problems. So I'll show you some quick results from two papers that we did to try to work on building ensembles that we think are reasonably well calibrated to quantify uncertainties in B. So one paper from now quite a while ago, uh, Jingfeng Zhao, working in Northern Wisconsin. Well, he was working at Penn State, but on data from Northern Wisconsin. And methodologically, we took a really simple model and lots of flux towers, the flux towers, the black triangles, and some broad assumptions about plant functional types, typical, you know, evergreen, deciduous, mixed, wood, woody wetland, water, and divided up the landscape. We then used an MCMC approach to optimize the model versus the flux towers and found probability distribution functions for the parameters, different probability functions for each plant functional type, PFT, reproduce the data quite well. And then pretty cool, by sampling those parameter PDFs, you can get gridded fluxes with the, the parameter sampling actually gives you the gridded flux uncertainties. So this is cool, I think. However, this assumes that the spatial structure of the flux uncertainty is represented by PFTs. It assumes that temporal uncertainty is captured within parameters that are fixed in time, and we have not tested those assumptions because, well, it can't do everything all at once. Unless you're in that movie, yeah. Okay, so this is good progress, but has some limits. Another example that's similar um, from Yuzhou, and you is in the meeting. I'm sorry, you, if I'm going to embarrass you by giving this talk, but hopefully not. This is a really cool piece of work that, that you put together as part of the ACT America project. Similar in approach to what Jingfeng Zhao did some years back, but with a uh, more complex model that is used a lot in atmospheric inversion systems, CASA. Again, used lots of flux towers, identified the parameters of the model that are most important, and then used comparisons with flux towers to come up with ranges for those parameters, similar to the PDF approach from Jingfeng Zhao, and then built an ensemble. And this is really cool. This is August 2010 example of fluxes. This is the mean of Yuzhou's ensemble. This is the spread, which gives us an idea of the pixel by pixel uncertainty. This is August 2010. This is 500 meter resolution for 15 years. Compares well to other models. It's a really handy tool and interesting piece of progress for connection to the atmospheric conversion world. However, um, it's still got the issue that we had from Jingfeng Zhao's work that we don't necessarily know the spatial structures or the temporal structures, or it's embedded in the model. Uh, we haven't tested those structures. But with a tool like this, this is a bit of an aside, I'm gonna risk taking time for this aside. We could build a calibrated atmospheric two ensemble, which is CO2 ensemble, which is fun. And so in this work, you we took ensemble members that include the biogenic fluxes, anthropogenic fluxes, atmospheric transport and lateral boundary conditions, all those parts to uncertainty in atmospheric CO2 and use mole fraction data over North America to calibrate that ensemble using rank histograms. This is Sha Feng's work. And the results are that we get mean fluxes and their impact on atmospheric CO2. So here, for example, is the impact of biogenic CO2 on atmospheric CO2, biogenic fluxes on atmospheric CO2 across North America for the month of July. And here are the uncertainty fields caused by all those different components of the ensemble. This is... Well, Austin Powers says it better than I do. I think this is really cool. But as I said, this has that limitations about what are the space and time structures of the uncertainties. 
So we got to go after that. So we've tried. I'm going to give you, show you two examples of our efforts to try to take apart those space and time error covariances using observations. So now a long time ago, Tim Hilton um, did some work on this problem. How did we do this? Tim took lots of flux towers, kind of got a common theme here, and optimized a simple model, another theme here, and then looked at the model data differences and tried to construct variograms. That is a function of the ver a difference between the models and the observations is a function of dis distance to find out if, as you get closer together, the, the model data differences become similar. Therefore, the errors are correlated. So the results were interesting, but not as satisfying as we would have hoped. Maybe the answer is a few hundred kilometers. This is the covariance range, the point at which the variogram flattens out as a function of many different approaches to optimizing VPRM. Perhaps the answer is a few hundred kilometers. We should try this again. We only tested in this for annual NEE. Inversions work at shorter time scales. We should redo this for shorter time scales. We compared flux towers to VPRM, which had been optimized. So maybe that was a little harsh on our own, own effort. And the flux tower network, honestly, is kind of sparse for this. This is a hard problem. It, it remains only partially solved. Second, I'm going to show you some work on the temporal autocovariance function. Uh, this is from Daniel Wesso's dissertation, which hopefully will, this work will be submitted very soon. Again, we use lots of flux towers. And again, we're looking at the differences between the flux towers, and in this case, Yuzhou's CASA ensemble mean. And Daniel said, well, we've looked at the spatial part. Let's look at the temporal part. Let's look at the temporal autocovariance function. And this result was jaw-dropping to me. Others have said, no, this is expected. This is the autocorrelation function for two sample towers. This is northern Wisconsin. This is uh, uh, Mead in Nebraska, crop site. And this is a time lag going up to a decade. And you would typically, I would have expected these errors to fall off over time and eventually become uncorrelated. They never decay. This is dominated, however, by the daily cycle. And we're using olson randerson downscaling. So Daniel is, has put together an error covariance function that one could use. It's pretty scary looking, but it's not that complicated, really, that you could use in an inversion it might be more efficient for you, you know, that means us, to reduce this large persistent error instead of making the inversion take out the daily cycle and then see if the inversion can get the slower time scale parts perhaps. In any case, just trying to push the ball down the court. So hopefully you see that more work is needed. The land data assimilation community has the expertise to contribute here and help inverse modelers and vice versa. So, you know, what are the next steps? Now you could sing this to the tune of the Battle Hymn of the Republic because when I saw Cedric Bakur's talk, uh, was that yesterday? I thought, wow, they've got it all. Um, so I won't actually sing this for you. And if anybody says they don't really use a Kalman filter, you know, you're too much of a nerd. Um, does something like Orchidas do it all? It has the atmosphere, it has the land surface, it's optimizing parameters, it has flux towers, holy cow. It still doesn't necessarily answer this question. It merges lots of data, solves parameters with atmospheric data, but there still has to be assumptions about these error structures. You know, there's PFTs um, and flux towers informing PFTs. So those error structures are still a question, I believe, even a wonderful system like that. It's a step in the right direction though, for sure. And I'm sorry, I didn't know I, if I had seen uh, Kotsuki-san's talk I'd add NECOM to this list. So my last thought um, is that I hope that this will encourage folks to look at models and data to explore these uncertainties, use this information to inform our inversion systems, and we've begun to walk down this path, but we have a ways to go. So please join in. Thank you. <laughs>